Hello, uh, my name is Luka Najkavia. I'm a chef from Georgia, and I'm really happy to be part of this project that is um, organized by Writers House of Georgia. And uh, today we're doing some kind of a continuation of uh, whatever we started in 2018 in Frankfurt Buchmesse. And uh, I'm going to introduce you to a Georgian dish that is called Hingali, which is one of those dishes I think that everybody should know around the world because it's one of the most important and most delicate parts of Georgian cuisine and general culinary culture. And uh, I'm going to go straight to the point and start cooking and uh, introduce you to the culture of Hingali slowly but surely. First of all, what we should do is uh, describe what is Hingali. And Hingali is a type of dumpling. And since it's a dumpling, uh, and I think it's one of the best dumplings in the world, um, I'm going to start preparing the dough. We will need some white flour, preferably any all-purpose flour or flour that is good for baking bread. Uh, not too much gluten and not too much ash, but uh, well balanced. And for every 400 grams of flour, we will need 130, 140 grams of water. The dough should be tough. And this is one of those traditional Georgian dishes that's been around for several centuries and before the occupation of 1921. And uh, it was even mentioned by Suha Sabah Beliani, one of the oldest uh, mentioned dishes in Georgian history that is still mostly unchanged over time. But definitely, like most great dishes, it has evolved, become better, more flavorful and tastier. And Hinkali is one of those dishes that is most definitely easily adapted to, f towards the whole world. Uh, it is made with different kind of stuffings. Over the years, the stuffings have changed. The originally, it was mostly either lamb or pork. And slowly, beef was introduced to it. Then maybe mushrooms, even cheese, potatoes. It's dumplings. So like most dumplings around the world, we share the culture of interchanging stuffings. The dough should be elastic and well rested, but really, really tough. This dish is one of those dishes that is uh, basically spread around all, all around the Georgia and with different varieties. And uh, in mountainous regions, it's usually less herbs and more uh, spices in the stuffing. And the dough itself is tougher and made with flour that is grayer, less pure, and um, mostly has a bit more ash. And the stuffing itself is less juicy. But in the lower parts of the country, in central Georgia, the traditional form is extra juicy with white flour, white dough. And uh, this makes this dish perfect dish for uh, basically any kind of beer uh, event. Whatever is beer, I think Ali is always almost present. And when is the better time than European Championship? So basically, <laughs> if there's anybody who's watching football, I recommend doing this recipe trying it out and enjoying beer and uh, think all together and watching Germany beat Hungary preferably or someone else later <laughs> if, if they beat Hungary, which they surely will. I hope so. <laughs> the main goal is to prepare a dough that is uniform, tough, and, and uh, usually takes up to 10 or 15 minutes of kneading. And uh, if you have a dough mixer, a hook or something, it won't work because there's not really a lot of uh, home appliances that can handle the toughness of this dough. So by hand it is. Like most of the Asian um, dumplings, it does need a bit of uh, human power to uh, put together. That's why I'm sweating right now and that's why I'm out of my breath. Okay. As soon as it's mostly uniform, what you can do is you can just wrap it in a cling wrap and put it in the fridge so that it kind of rests and becomes even more uniform and then you can redo the process again and make it even more elastic. I'm going to let this rest now. In reality, I have a dough prepared yeah, beforehand which has been resting in the fridge for several hours now. So I'm going to use that one because it needs at least like an hour of resting when, for it to become uh, as flavorful and as elastic as we need because water does activate the flavors in gluten and in flour altogether. So that's an integral part of hinkali because the flavor of the hinkali is not only the meats and the spices that goes in the stuffing, but also uh, the flour that you're using. It mixes well together and gives you a nice broth inside the dumpling. When it comes to stuffing, 
Kingali, this is where usually the magic happens. I've prepared in advance two types of mints. Here we have pork belly, which in Georgia is called umzeuri, as it translates into a part that never sees the sun, so it's the belly part of the pig. And we're also using beef shoulder, which is a very flavorful, fatty part of a beef. Beef shoulder and pork together give us the best uh, variety of broth. But there's different varieties. There might be only pork, only beef, uh, but usually the fat part is the important part. The fattier, the better. Right now what I'm doing is using two types of uh, meat with a ratio of one to one. So here's beef, and that's not enough. To get the flavorful broth, you also need onions. And usually the ratio of onions to meat, meat is one to three. So one part onions and three parts of meat. And again, usually in mountainous regions of Georgia, onions are minced together with the meat. And that they're not really minced by a machine or anything. They're usually minced with an, either a knife or something like a machete or an axe or as the traditional way goes with a sword. So they usually take a piece of wood, a thick one, just lay the meat on it and just chop it as much as they can. And what it does, it, does, it gives you juicier mince. But uh, the juiciness is usually guaranteed by a different part of the recipe, which I'll show you. When it comes to onions, just do as fine as you can. But the interesting part is that it shouldn't be pureed. It's always better if you feel patches of onion, crunches of onion inside the thick mince in the stuffing. There's one thing that uh, Georgians always mess up when they make kingali, not always, but sometimes mess up when they make kingali, that's that they use garlic, and garlic is one of those ingredients that should never go into a kingali, even though some might disagree. The traditional recipes never mentioned any kinds of garlic, so it's mostly onions. One of the top tips for actually tasting Hinkali and eating Hinkali is that, of course, there are many restaurants in Georgia that serve great Hinkali. But uh, if, you, if you're ever in doubt which Hinkali to eat, uh, which kind of Hinkali to eat, so the mountain region type without herbs or one with the herbs, if you have doubt that the restaurant has, serves really good Hinkali, always go for the one with the herbs, because one with the herbs usually has better flavor because uh, it's easier to turn into rich broth because it has herbs and, least, and it needs least amount of fine tuning to get a flavorful aroma. But if you know that restaurant is really good at Hinkali, always go for the one from the mountains, Tiuluri, because Tiuluri is the authentic form and if the meat is the best quality and if the onions are great and if, and if the water ratio to the spices is great, uh, then you get the best kind of experience. So uh, this tip was discovered by me and my friend uh, who kept uh, ordering, anytime we went to a restaurant that serves Hinkali, she kept ordering uh, one with the herbs and always her choice was the better flavored because most restaurants didn't really handle Hinkali well and uh, so then we went on a small bar hopping kind of event but it was Hinkali hopping basically and we tried different kind of Hinkali during a day and yes the best one was one without the herbs but uh, usually the Above average ones were the uh, one with the herbs, and the really bad ones were one without the herbs. So uh, the experiment showed us that uh, in most restaurants, handle one with the herbs better than one without. So again, if you're sure about the quality of a restaurant, go for the one with all the herbs. But if it's just a random restaurant that also serves some kind of other food, except Georgian, go with the one with the herbs. Okay, since now we have uh, our onions and meats inside the bowl, now it's time to prepare the spices. And um, also one of the original recipes of Hinkali usually only called for three ingredients. It was onions, it was uh, chilies, and black pepper. 
and salt, of course. But then, uh, whenever they came in doubts uh, of beef being the best quality and the best flavored one, they would usually add either caraway or type of Georgian cumin to flavor it even further and cover the less good parts of the flavors from the meat, which was not the best quality. Of course, now all the meat is good quality and it's easier, but this tradition stayed over, so caraway and uh, um, cumin are mainstays in the recipe. So, seeds of caraway or cumin, but Georgian cumin is a bit more different flavored than the other ones, so if you're doing this in Germany, go for the caraway seeds. A teaspoon of black pepper, which is also usually a classical topping for the dish, and mash it. Of course, it's always easier to get the powder, but uh, if you want to get the best aromas, of course, every single time go for the seeds. Having a mortar and a pasta in the kitchen is one of the most important parts. One of the interesting uh, differences in the cultures of culinary cultures, almost every family in Georgia has a mitmincer, which is not as common in Europe. Now, it's usually more uh, common that people just go to a butcher shop and min mince meat there. But in Georgia, people like to mince meat a lot, so most every single family has a type of a meat mincer there at home. So, just make sure this is really, really well ground. And yes, this is tasking. To get the best flavors, it's usually, you need to, br need to break some sweat. Now, chilies. A huge pinch and keep on grinding. Usually having Hing Ali being really, really hot and spicy is not a thing to do, not the best choice, but uh, the region I'm from, from Georgia, San Miguelo is notable for spicy food, so I keep on adding inadequate amounts of chilies to everything. I'm gonna do the same to Hing Ali, which is kind of blasphemous, but uh, let's be honest, it improves the flavor. So gloves, first of all, combine the onions with the mince. And try to be as aggressive as possible with the meat, so you kind of mash the onion juice into the meat. Most restaurants in Georgia prefer the ratio of 30% pork to 70% of beef, uh, but the best thing I've usually tasted is uh, either only pork, or just one to one ratio. But as that is also just subjective as hell because uh, there are as many different varieties of, and op of opinions about Hinkali in Georgia as their recipes and humans in Georgia. So uh, everybody has their own version of Hinkali that is best. This is just one of the versions that is best for me. Um, but to be honest, if you wanna have the prime experience of Hinkali, it should be all three meats. Like it should be beef, pork and lamb, and 40% mm, of beef, 30 pork, 30 lamb is the best combo ever, but usually not everybody likes the smell and the flavor of lamb in Georgia, because Georgian lamb is a bit more intense in flavor than the ones usually on the market around the world, so uh, usually most of the people and people around here right now who are in our uh, group Chef Cave prefer ones without the lamb. As at least ones that are not chefs or cooks, because every single cook I think likes <laughs> lamb, but not, uh, not producers or directors or <laughs> sound editors here, so there we go. First of all, before you do the spices, you salt. You salt the dish, and the usual ratio is 1.2 to 1.5% of salt to meat ratio. This dish is one of the best known ones for uh, one particular reason. If you had a heavy night of drinking and uh, you want to go to sleep without having a hangover the next day, what you do is either you hink eat hinkali before you go to sleep, which is probably a bit too tasking for the stomach, or what you do is a traditional time and tested tried tradition of Georgian cuisine is just wake up in the morning and go for hinkali at 12 p.m., which is, uh, I think, 
something that every Georgian has experienced. And if they have not, I think they're not, they really, truly do not qualify as Georgians. Probably, I don't know. <laughs> like Georgians are born with a glass of wine in their hand and a hinkali in the other one. So that's how usually how it works. Okay, now, spices. And do not overspice, usually for uh, almost a kilo and a half of mince. Uh, one tablespoon of uh, spices is more than enough. The main flavor should always be meat, onions, and the, and the broth itself that is created from those two things. And the saltiness, of course. And now covers the most integral part of Hinkali stuffing, which is adding water or broth to the mince. So the whole idea is that for hinkali to be as juicy as possible, uh, the broth, the mince should be basically a liquid. And now what we have here is some beef broth. It could be water or beef broth. Doesn't really matter uh, if you don't want to get the best flavor. If you want to get the best flavor, you usually use beef broth. Make sure it's not too salty so that you don't oversalt the mince. And you can watch how much of the uh, broth is incorporated into the mince. And basically, uh, one of the top skills that a hinkali cook should have is just the ability to uh, wrap a hinkali with as much as water as possible in the mince. It usually makes the job harder and gives you less time to cook the hinkali because the uh, wet and because the wetness of the mince usually dampens the dough when you're rolling it and when you're tying it so it gives you less time to actually start boiling it so the know-how and the technique hides in the amount of water that is in the mince and one of the ways to double check the right amount of water in the mince is to take a tablespoon just place it into the mince and push it down a bit and if the water starts running into the tablespoon then it has the right amount of water and you can see that it's not doing it so it means it can take even more broth but this is the best time to double check if there's enough spices. So you should smell it and smell the spices. If you don't, you add the spices. I said the word spices too many times already, I think. <laughs> a bit more. A bit of black pepper as well. A bit more chilies. Glove. And more broth. So the more pork it has, the more water it will absorb. Because pork in this case has more fat and lets the mince engulf more water without releasing it because it plays the role of a barrier. But it's juicy enough. Maybe a bit more. There you go. Right now, the mince is perfect. So, let this rest. Just set it in the fridge for at least like 20 minutes before we roll the dough, and then we stuff it. Now for the TV magic, we've prepared the dough in advance. So, we have several pieces here. And uh, this part, is not necessarily the most fun part, but is an important part. What we need to do is we have to make dough discs. So that in those dough discs, we put in the mince that just, that's in the fridge, and uh, then we tie it, and there's a very special way of tying it, which has its own semi-religious cultural symbolism, full of legends and myths. So let's begin. What you need is either you flatten the dough altogether and then you cut out the forms or you just make discs like this and then you flatten those. Usually in the restaurants they don't do it this way because it usually takes more time and is not as efficient. But at home this is the way to go because it's just basically easier. And make sure the dough doesn't dry out. So what you do is you cover it with cling wrap.
we start with a single piece. I'm going to show you how to make it. And you just basically repeat the process over and over again. Bit of flour. And this part is similar to most of the dumplings around the world. Make a thin disc. That the tougher the dough, the more stable it will be during the boiling. And one of the myths surrounding this shape form is that um, in physics, the higher the altitude, the lower the pressure. So basically, uh, water boils on a lower temperature than on a higher pressure surrounding. So basically, if you're in, for example, Berlin or Munich, water will boil uh, on a higher temperature than, in, for example, somewhere in Alps. So uh, what this does is you create a basically a chamber, high pressure chamber when you tie this, and it lets the boil boiling temperature rise. So it does the water actually inside the Hingali doesn't boil it 100 degrees, it boils at 101 or 102, which creates even better flavor. So it's basically like a pressure cooker. One, flour it, then the second one. And usually in restaurants, when this dish is prepared, it's several people working on it. Even though there are some new technologies that make these things easier, rolling pins, automated ones and everything, the traditional way is just several people, several cooks sitting around the table and just like a human conveyor belt basically creating hundreds and hundreds of hingalis. And the hingali basically is one of the coolest dishes, in my opinion, because it has uh, so much mythos and methodology around it that uh, eating it, even eating and preparing it is really fun. So, uh, for example, the specific ways of eating it are, there's some rules to eating it, basically. And the one of the rules is that it shouldn't tear while being eaten and the juice from the hingali shouldn't pour over onto the plate. And uh, you should never use a fork or a spoon or anything. So there's like uh, several rules. And I've seen people be get scolded on a Georgian feast just because of eating hingali with a wrong utensil or without their hands or just not finishing it or just adding anything to it. The only ingredient that you can actually add to hingali is pepper, black pepper, which I also think is wrong. But uh, some people think it's right, so let them eat it with black pepper. But um, then there's another category of people who add some vinegar to it. And those people go to the same hell as people who talk in the theater or uh, basically burn books. So <laughs> um, there's a lot of basically, I think Ali has lots of traditions. And um, uh, that's why it's one of the coolest dishes around, I think. Even some of my friends eat think Ali with vinegar. And yeah, it's like a good addition of sourness if you're hungover, because hingali is like probably number one hang hangover dish in the world. I'd say it's even better than ramen, or I don't know, most of the soups around the world. But uh, again, rules are rules, and they've been around for several hundred years in Georgia. And uh, I'd say if there are any Georgian rules you have to obey, is that is, it right, is the right way of eating hingali is one of the most important ones just because it's really, really fun. And it just gives you the best flavor. Okay, so now since the water is boiling and you always need a big pot, this is not the biggest one we have, but we're not gonna boil more than four together. Uh, you add a fistful of salt to it. You basically use the same amount of salt you would use for a pasta, maybe a bit more. And now what we do is we add mince to the dough and tie the hingali. You can see ha here how much water the mince has. You have to incorporate the water back into the meat so it's not too apart. Uh, 
What you do is you take the piece of dough, take a spoonful of mince, and put it in the middle. And then you tie it. And the, the most important part is you have to fold. And you fold the same way you would fold a letter, basically. And every next one should be bit after the previous one. And you go around and just pinch it. And you just cut off the top. And there you go. The hinkali is done. And you make sure that you use some flour underneath so it doesn't leak any juices. And uh, when it comes to folding hinkali, uh, there are different kinds of opinions. Some say there should be 18 folds. Some say there should be 21 folds. I've heard even 17 folds. Some have said that nine folds are enough. There's basically different opinions about it. I think as many opinions as there are regions that are native to Hinkali. But uh, basically, as many folds you can do is good. Any leftover dough is usually collected. You add some damp dampness to it, maybe wet hand, and just re-roll it again and you can make more hinkali from this. So there's four of us here, and I'm not going to overcrowd the pan, so I'm going to just boil four. Usually, make sure that you have at least 20 times more water in mass than you have hinkali. So if you're doing a kilo of hinkali, have 20 liters of water in a pot so that it boils fast and evenly. Spin the water so we have a current, and drop in the hinkalis so that they don't stick. Every culinary culture has their own rules, basically, and some things they agree on. And I think uh, one of the things that the Georgian culture has agreed, all of us chefs have agreed, that one of those dishes that does not really need any tempering or any manipulations on a nationwide level is hinkali. You don't really need to improve anything, basically just improve ingredients. And uh, we tend to avoid uh, changing hinkali too much. And if we do, we try to basically just promote variety that is logical. So the most important parts of hinkali are always the broth, the brothiness, the heartiness, basically, and the comfort. So we try to avoid gourmet types of hinkali that have basically uh, ingredients that are too posh or too expensive. Because one of the things that hinkali has uh, in, uh, in the culture that is very essential to its sense is that uh, it's cheap and you usually eat several of these. So basically it's food for the people. So sooner or later, hinkalis are going to start floating and expanding. At this point, there's a risk of it bursting, so you have to be attentive. And it's really important so that you don't take it out of the pot right away while it's expanded and bloated because uh, the change in pressure is going to burst it. So uh, one of the traditional things Georgians do is just you shower it with cold water so it cools down, deflates, and then you take it out. You chill it down. Take it out. Okay. So uh, place it upside down. Classical topping, as I said, is pepper. I'm gonna pepper yours, but I'm not gonna pepper mine. And uh, the also, Chinkali has this wonderful tradition uh, when you cook it, eat it, and there's some left over. The leftover hinkali, which is already boiled, is usually fried. And I'd say that's one of the most magical uh, after parties <laughs> on any uh, uh, feast in the world, when the main event, usually, which is hinkali, turns into a side event <laughs> or after party event, which basically is uh, really sought after. But it's never, almost, almost never usually made as a main event. So uh, I'd like you guys here who, who are shooting this video to try hinkali. Uh, any hinkali that is not eaten is a hinkali lost 
and uh, not valued. I'm going to start with the first one. Okay. So, uh, <coughs> okay. So, <laughs> meanwhile, while our friends here are eating, I hope you can see the face of this person here who's enjoying Kinkali, and that's the usually the face you have to get, like uh, like you're hearing a pieza, you know, like you're hearing an opera, you know, like it's Pavarotti who's singing, or I don't know, Wagner playing, I don't know, something like that. <laughs> uh, basically, if you have the same emotions towards food as um, you have towards Richard Wagner, for example, then you did the Hinkali right, and you did the Hinkali justice, basically. So um, remember, if the Hinkali doesn't make you make this face, <laughs> then the Hinkali wasn't <laughs> the right kind of Hinkali. So <laughs> you like it? Nice. So. I hope you enjoyed this, and uh, I hope you're going to try this at home. It's one of the easiest dishes. I didn't want to complicate it any further because I want this dish to be international, and I want everybody to be able to enjoy this experience because it is hands down one of the most uh, complete and perfect dishes anywhere in this world. And um, I hope all the cultures will adopt it. And I think this uh, fits perfectly for a German flavor profile because we here like German food a lot, so I assume the Germans also would like Georgian food because um, since we enjoy your flavors, I'd say some of the flavors are similar. So, yeah. Give it a try and um, actually, if you try it, uh, write us on Chef K on Instagram and just tell us about your feelings <laughs> towards Sengali. We'd love to hear it. And um, have a great day. Thanks. <laughs>